few figures in the history of our world are as beloved or has commanded as much respect as the Dalai Lama. So who is this man? What does it take to become a Dalai Lama? Let's look back into the rich history of the men behind this prestigious title. The title of Dalai Lama is given by the Tibetan people to the foremost spiritual leader of the Jelug, also known as the Yellow Hat School of Tibetan Buddhism. This is the newest of the classical schools of Tibetan Buddhism. Currently the 14th Dalai Lama is a man by the name of Tenzin Gyatso who lives as a refugee in India. The Dalai Lama is considered to be the successor in a line of reincarnated custodians who are believed to be the incarnations of Avalokitesvara, a bodhisattva of compassion. Bodhisattvas are people who are able to achieve nirvana but choose not to do so as a means to save beings who are suffering. The title Dalai Lama is a combination of the Mongolic word Dalai, which means ocean or big, and the Tibetan word Blama, which translates to master or guru. Since the time of the fifth Dalai Lama who lived during the 17th century, his celebrity has always served as a symbol of the unification of Tibet, where he has represented Buddhist traditions and values. The Dalai Lama was a prominent figure of the Jeluk tradition, which was numerically and politically powerful in central Tibet, but it's the Dalai Lama's religious authority that goes way beyond sectarian boundaries. The basic function of the Dalai Lama is to serve as a non-denominational figure who holds together different regional and religious groups. The Dalai Lama has worked incredibly hard to overcome sectarian and other divisions in the exiled community and has become a symbol of Tibetan nationhood for Tibetans both in Tibet and in exile. The history of the Dalai Lamas is steeped in legend. Several sources and scholars have stated that there's an informal line of succession of the present Dalai Lamas as incarnations of Avalokitesvara. This line stretches back much further than the very first Dalai Lama, a man known as Jendan Drub. According to the Book of Kadam, which is a compilation of Kadampa teachings largely composed around discussions between the Indian sage Atiza and his Tibetan host and chief disciple Dromtonpa, and tales of the previous incarnations of Arya Avalokitesvara, nominate as many as 60 persons prior to Jendan Drub. These 60 are enumerated as earlier incarnations of Avalokitesvara and predecessors in the same lineage leading up to him. This number includes a mythology of 36 Indian personalities along with 10 early Tibetan kings and emperors. All of them are said to be previous incarnations of Drom Tompa and 14 further Nepalese and Tibetan yogis and sages in between him and the first Dalai Lama. According to an article on the 14th Dalai Lama's website entitled Birth to Exile, he is the 74th in a lineage that can be traced back to a Brahmin boy who lived in the time of Buddha Shakyamuni. Let's take a look at all of the people who served as Dalai Lama over the centuries. 
the lineage of the Dalai Lama stemmed from truly humble beginnings. Pema Dorji, who lived from 1391 until 1474, was a boy who was to become the first in the line. He was born inside of a cattle pen in Shabtog Sang in 1391. His parents were nomads who lived in tents and kept goats and sheep. Upon the death of his father in 1398, his mother wasn't able to support the young goat herder, so she had no choice but to entrust them to his uncle, a monk at Narthang, a major Kadampa monastery near Shigatsi for education as a Buddhist monk. During this period, Narthang ran the largest printing press in Tibet, and it was home to a vast and celebrated library that attracted adepts and scholars from far and wide. It was there that Pema Dorji got an education that went far beyond the norm at the time. He was also exposed to diverse spiritual schools and ideas. Dorji studied a great deal of Buddhist philosophy and in the year 1405 he was ordained by Narthang's abbot. Upon his ordination he took the name of Jendun Drup. Drup was immediately recognized as an exceptional pupil and as a result the abbot took special interest in his progress so he tutored him personally. In 12 years, Drup passed the 12 grades of monkhood and was then able to take the highest vows. After completing his intensive studies at Narthang, Drup left to continue at specialist monasteries in central Tibet. It was there that his grounding at Narthang was celebrated among many of the people he encountered. In 1415, Jendon Drup met the founder of the Jalugpa school, Song Karpa, and became his student. Their meeting was of a political and historical significance because it would lead to him being known as the first Dalai Lama. Eventually, when Song Karpa's successor Kedrub Ji, the Panchen Lama, died, Drup assumed the role of leader of the Jalugpa. He then rose to become abbot of Drapong, which was widely considered to be the greatest Jalugpa monastery outside of Lhasa. Jendan Drup was known to be the greatest scholar saint that was ever produced by the Narthang monastery. He became the single most important lama in Tibet. Through tons of tireless hard work, Drup became a leading lama and was known as perfecter of the monkhood with a host of disciples. Although Drup was born in a cattle pen to be a simple goat herder, he rose to become one of the most celebrated and respected teachers in Tibet and Central Asia. In the year 1474, at the age of 84, older than any of his 13 successors, Drup went on foot to visit Narthang Monastery on a final teaching tour. Afterwards, he returned home and his followers consider him to have died in a blaze of glory. Drup was recognized as having attained Buddhahood. His mortal remains were interred in a bejeweled silver stupa at Tashalumpo, which survived the Cultural Revolution and can still be seen to this very day. After Jendan Drup passed on, a boy named Sangye Pel was born to Nyingma adepts at Yolkar in Sang. At three years old, he declared himself to be Jendan Drup and asked to be taken home to Tashilumpo. Pell spoke in mystical verses and frequently quoted classical texts out of the blue. He also professed to be Drom Tonpa, an earlier incarnation of the Dalai Lamas. When he came into contact with monks from Tashilumpo, he astonishingly greeted the disciples of the late Jendan Drup by name. 
This led the Jalugpa elders to break with tradition and recognize him as Jendundrup's reincarnation by the time that he was eight years old. It was his father who took him on his teachings and retreats until he reached the age of 12. He was trained in all the family Nyingma lineages. It was during this time that he was officially installed at Tashilumpo as Jendandrup's incarnation. He was ordained, enthroned and renamed Jendan Gayatso Palzangpo and lived until the year 1542. Palzangpo was tutored personally by the abbot and he made rapid progress. In 1492, when he was just 17 years old, it was requested that he teach all over Sang. Wherever he spoke, thousands of people would gather to listen and pay homage, including senior abbots and scholars. By the age of 19, he met some opposition from the Tashalumpo establishment. Tensions were on the rise over conflicts between advocates of the two types of succession, incarnation and the traditional abbatial election through merit. Although Palzangpo had served for several years as Tashilumpo's abbot, he moved to central Tibet where he was invited to Dripong. That was where his reputation as a brilliant young teacher grew rapidly. Palzangpo was accorded all the loyalty and devotion that Jendandrup had earned, and as a result, the Jelag school remained as united as ever. His move had served to shift central Jelag authority back to Lhasa. Under Palzangpo's leadership, the sect continued to grow in influence and size. With its appeal of simplicity, devotion and strictness, its lamas were asked to mediate disputes between other rivals. In 1509, Pao Zhangpo moved to southern Tibet, where he built the Chukorgyal Monastery near the Oracle Lake Lamo Latso. It was completed by 1511. That year, he saw visions in the lake and empowered it to impart clues to help identify incarnate lamas. All Dalai Lamas from the third onwards were found with the help of such visions granted to regents. By now, Pao Zhangpo was widely regarded as one of Tibet's greatest saints and scholars. Upon his return to Tashalumpo in 1512, he was given the residence built for Jendandrup. Palzangpo continued to travel widely and teach while based at Tibet's largest monastery, Drapung, where he became known as Drapung Lama. It wasn't long before his fame and influence spread all over Central Asia. By 1525, Pao Zhangpo was already the abbot of Chukorgyal, Drapung and Tashilumpo. That year, he was also abbot of the Sera Monastery as well. He died whilst in meditation at Drapung in 1547 at the age of 67. It was said that by the time he died, his personal influence covered the whole of Buddhist Central Asia, where there was nobody of any consequence who did not know of him. As predicted by his predecessor, the third Dalai Lama was named Sonam Gyatso. He was born in 1543 in Tolung, near Lhasa. Gyatso claimed he was Jendun Gyatso and could readily recall events from his previous life. Gyatso was recognized as the incarnation, named Sonam Gyatso and was thus installed at Trapung. There he quickly excelled his teachers in knowledge and wisdom and developed extraordinary powers. 
Unlike the previous Dalai Lamas, he came from a noble family that was connected with the Sakya and the Phagmo Drupa dynasties. Gyatso is known to have spearheaded the conversion of Mongolia to Buddhism. A brilliant scholar and teacher, Gyatso had the spiritual maturity to be made abbot of Drapung when he was just nine years old, thereby taking responsibility for the spiritual and material well-being of Tibet's largest monastery. By 10 years of age, Gyatso led the Monlam Prayer Festival, giving daily discourses to the assembly of all Jalugpa monks. His influence grew incredibly fast, and soon the monks at Sera Monastery also made him their abbot. In 1559, by the age of 16, he was invited to Nodong by King Ungawang Tashidrakpa, a Kama Kagyu supporter, and became his personal teacher. When fighting broke out in Lhasa between Jelug and Kagyu parties, and efforts by local lamas to mediate failed, 17-year-old Gyatsu helped to negotiate a peaceful settlement. His popularity and renown became so huge by the year 1564, when the Nodong king died, it was 21-year-old Gyatsu that was requested to lead the funeral rites instead of his own Kagyu lamas. Thanks to Gyatso, Buddhism had spread rapidly across Mongolia, and soon the Jalugpa had won the spiritual allegiance of most of the Mongolian tribes. Gyatso himself sponsored the building of Thegchen Chongkor Monastery at the site of Gyatso's open-air teachings given to the whole Mongol population. He became known as Sonam Gyatso Dalai, which is Mongolian for Gyatso, which in turn means ocean. It wasn't long before the term Dalai Lama, by which the lineage later became known throughout the non-Tibetan world, was established and then applied to the first two incarnations retrospectively. Arriving in Mongolia in the year 1585, Gyatso stayed for two years with Mongol ruler During Khan, teaching Buddhism to his people and converting more Mongol princes and their tribes. Gyatso was summoned to China to meet with the emperor in Beijing and died whilst en route in 1588. As the 45-year-old was dying, his Mongolian converts pleaded with him to not leave because they needed his unwavering religious leadership. He promised his followers that he would be incarnated next in Mongolia as a Mongolian. The fourth Dalai Lama, Yontan Gyatso, was born in 1589 and was the Mongolian great-grandson of Alton Khan, who was himself a descendant of Kublai Khan and king of the Tumid Mongols. They had already been converted to Buddhism by the third Dalai Lama. This deep connection to their homeland caused the Mongols to vigorously support the Jalugpa sect in Tibet. By the age of 10, Yontan travelled with a large Mongol escort to Lhasa, where he was enthroned. Yontan studied at Trapang and became its abbot. Being a non-Tibetan, he was met with opposition from some Tibetans, especially the Kama Kagyu, who felt their position had been threatened by these events, and as a result, several attempts were made to remove him from power. Sadly, Yontan Gyatso died at the all-too-young age of just 27, under what could only be described as suspicious circumstances. It was his chief attendant, Sonam Rabton, who went on to discover the fifth Dalai Lama. The fourth Dalai Lama's death in 1617 led to a lot of chaos. Open conflicts began breaking out between various parties. The foremost issue surrounded the Sangpa dynasty, who served as rulers of central Tibet from Shigatse. 
They were staunch supporters of the Karmapa school and absolute rivals to the Jalugpa. The Sangpa forbade the search for the incarnation of the next Dalai Lama. In the year 1618, Rabton, the former attendant of the fourth Dalai Lama, secretly identified the child that had already been born to the noble Zahor family at Tagsi Castle, south of Lhasa. Afterwards, Shigetsu's Panchen Lama negotiated the lifting of the ban. This enabled the boy to be recognized as Lobsang Gyatso, the fifth Dalai Lama. Throughout the Fifth's minority, it was the forceful and influential Sonam Repton that inspired the Zungar Mongols to defend the Jalugpa by taking action against their enemies. It was this very strategy that led to the destruction and dismantling of the Sangpa dynasty. By virtue of his position as the Dalai Lama's chief attendant, when the Dalai Lama became absolute ruler of Tibet in 1642, Rabton became the Viceroy, which meant that it was his job to manage the day-to-day -day ruler of Tibet's governmental affairs. Sonam Rabton died in 1658. The next year, the fifth Dalai Lama appointed his younger brother, Deepa Norbu, who was also known as Nangso Norbu, as his successor. Unfortunately, after a few months, Norbu betrayed him and led a rebellion against the Ganden Fodrang government. The Dalai Lama unflinchingly and skillfully foiled his younger brother's plans without any fighting taking place and Norbu had to flee. The Dalai Lama appointed four other viceroys to take his place, Lozang Tutop, Trinli Gyatso, Sangyi Gyatso and Lozang Jinpa. The fifth Dalai Lama died in the year 1682 and his passing was kept secret for 15 years by his regent Sangyi Gyatso. Sangyi pretended that during this time the Dalai Lama was on a retreat and ruled for him by proxy. During this time Sangyi secretly selected the sixth Dalai Lama and presented him as someone else. The sixth Dalai Lama, Sangyang Gyatso, was born in 1683 near Tawang, which is currently in India. He was picked out in the year 1685, but wasn't enthroned until the year 1697, when the death of the fifth Dalai Lama, Lobsang Gyatso, was officially announced. After spending 16 years studying as a novice monk, he rejected full ordination and surrendered his monastic life and monk's robes for the lifestyle of a layman. Despite his behavior, most Tibetans still supported him as the Dalai Lama. In the year 1706, with the compliance of the Kangxi Emperor, the sixth Dalai Lama was deposed and arrested by a ruler named Lazang Khan, who had usurped the Tibetan throne and considered Sangyang to be an imposter set up by the regent. Khan, who was now acting ruler, was the only outright foreigner to ever assume the Tibetan throne. Khan sent Sangyang to Beijing under escort to appear before the Emperor, but he ended up dying mysteriously from an illness whilst en route. After discrediting and eventually deposing the sixth Dalai Lama, Lazang Khan asked the Lhasa Jalugpa Lamas to endorse a new Dalai Lama as a means to be a true incarnation of the fifth. Eventually, Pikar Zinpa, a monk but also rumored to be Lazang's son, was nominated, and Lazang had him installed as the real sixth Dalai Lama in 1707. The Tibetan people did not approve of this choice or Khan's taking of the Tibetan throne, and this led to a political struggle. 
In 1708, a child called Kelzang Gyatso had been born at Lithang in eastern Tibet. It wasn't long before the Tibetan people claimed that he has to be the next incarnation. After going into hiding out of fear of Lazang Khan, Kelzang was installed at Lithang Monastery. Soon afterwards, along with rivals of Lazang and some of the Kokonor Mongol princes, and in absolute defiance of the situation in Lhasa, the Tibetans of Kham duly recognized him as the seventh Dalai Lama in the year 1712, whilst retaining his birth name of Kelzang Gyatso. As a means to keep him safe, he was moved to Dirge Monastery, and eventually in 1716, he was backed and sponsored by the Kangxi Emperor of China. By the time the seventh Dalai Lama passed on in the year 1757 at the age of 49, the entire Dzungar people had been nearly exterminated through years of genocidal campaigns by Qing armies and deadly smallpox epidemics. Any survivors were being forcibly transported into China. Their lands were emptied and then awarded to other people. Despite having lived through such dark and violent times, Kelzang Gyatso was considered to be the most spiritually learned and accomplished of any Dalai Lama. Kelzang's written works comprised several hundred titles, including what are believed to be some of Tibet's finest spiritual literary achievements. Even though he lacked zeal in politics, Kelzang is credited with establishing the reformed government of Tibet, headed by the Dalai Lama in 1751. Kelzang died in 1757. The eighth Dalai Lama was named Jamfel Gyatso. He was born in Sang in 1758 and died at the age of 46. Jamfel took little part in Tibetan politics and left most temporal matters to his regents and the Ambans. The eighth Dalai Lama was approved by the Emperor of China to be exempted from the lot drawing ceremony of using Chinese golden urn. The Qianlong Emperor officially accepted Jiangbai as the 8th Dalai Lama when the 6th Panchen Erdeni came to congratulate the Emperor on his 70th birthday in the year 1780. The 8th Dalai Lama was granted a Jade Seal of Authority and Jade Sheets of Confirmation of Authority by the Emperor of China. The Dalai Lama, his later generations and the local government cherished both the Jade Seal of Authority and the Jade Sheets of Authority. They were properly preserved as the route to their ruling power. Although the 8th Dalai Lama lived almost as long as the 7th, he was overshadowed by many contemporary Lamas in terms of both religious and political accomplishment. Despite that, Jamfal Gyatso was also said to possess all the signs of being the true incarnation of the Seventh. This was also claimed to have been confirmed by many portents clear to the Tibetans, and so in 1762, at the age of five, he was duly enthroned as the Eighth Dalai Lama at the Potala Palace. At the age of 23, he was persuaded to assume the throne as ruler of Tibet with a regent to assist him, and after three years of this, when the regent went to Beijing as ambassador in the year 1784, he continued to rule solo for a further four years. Feeling unsuited to worldly affairs, however, and unhappy in this role, he then retired from public office to concentrate on religious activities for his remaining 16 years until his death in 1804. 
He was also credited with the construction of the Norbulinka Summer Palace, started by his predecessor in Lhasa, and with ordaining some 10,000 monks in his efforts to foster monasticism. Born in Cam in either 1805 or 1806, amidst the usual miraculous signs, the ninth Dalai Lama, Lungtok Gyatso, was appointed by the 7th Panchen Lama's search team at the age of two, and enthroned in the Potala in 1808 at an impressive ceremony attended by representatives from China, Mongolia, Nepal and Bhutan. Tibetan historian Naima Gyenkain and Wang Jiwei point out that the 9th Dalai Lama was allowed to use the seal of authority given to the late 8th Dalai Lama by the Emperor of China. His second regent, Dimo Tolku, was the biographer of the 8th and 9th Dalai Lamas, and though the 9th died at the age of 9, his biography is as lengthy as those of many of the early Dalai Lamas. In 1793, under Manchu pressure, Tibet had closed its borders to foreigners, but in 1811, a British sinologist, Thomas Manning, became the first Englishman to visit Lhasa. Considered to be the first Chinese scholar in Europe, he stayed for five months and gave enthusiastic accounts in his journal of his regular meetings with the Ninth Dalai Lama, whom he found fascinating. He said he was beautiful, elegant, refined, intelligent and entirely self-possessed, even at the age of six. Three years later, in March 1815, the young Lungtok Gyatso caught a severe cold, and leaving the Potala Palace to preside over the New Year Monlam Prayer Festival, he contracted pneumonia from which he soon died. Like the seventh Dalai Lama, the tenth, Sultrim Gyatso, was born in Lifang Kam, where the third Dalai Lama had built a monastery. It was 1816, and Regent Dimo Tolku and the 7th Panchen Lama followed indications from Nichung, the state oracle, which led them to appoint him at the age of two. He passed all the tests and was brought to Lhasa, but official recognition was delayed until 1822, when he was enthroned and ordained by the 7th Panchen Lama. There are conflicting reports about whether the Chinese golden urn was utilized by drawing lots to choose him. The 10th Dalai Lama mentioned in his biography that he was allowed to use the golden seal of authority based on the convention set up by the late Dalai Lama. At the investiture, decree of the Emperor of China was issued and read out. After 15 years of intensive studies and failing health, he died in 1837 at the age of 20 or 21. He identified with ordinary people rather than the court officials and often sat on his veranda in the sunshine with the office clerks. Intending to empower the common people, he planned to institute political and economic reforms to share the nation's wealth more equitably. Over this period, his health had deteriorated, the implication being that he may have suffered from slow poisoning by Tibetan aristocrats, whose interests these reforms were threatening. Born in Gathar Kam in 1838, and soon discovered by the official search committee with the help of Nichung Oracle, the 11th Dalai Lama was brought to Lhasa in 1841, and recognized, enthroned and named Kedrop Gyatsu by the Panchen Lama in 1842, who also ordained him in 1846. After that, he was immersed in religious studies under the Panchen Lama, amongst other great masters. 
Eventually, the third Reeting Rinpoche was made regent, and in 1855, Kedrup Gyatso, appearing to be an extremely promising prospect, was requested to take the reins of power at the age of 17. He was enthroned as ruler of Tibet in 1855 following Xianfeng Emperor's order. He died after just 11 months, no reason for his sudden and premature death being given in these accounts, Shakabpa and Mullin's histories both being based on untranslated Tibetan chronicles. The respected Reeting Rinpoche was recalled once again to act as regent and requested to lead the search for the next incarnation, the Twelfth. In 1856, a child was born in south-central Tibet amidst all the usual extraordinary signs. He came to the notice of the search team, was investigated, passed the traditional tests, and was recognized as the 12th Dalai Lama in 1858. The use of the Chinese golden urn, at the insistence of the regent, who was later accused of being a Chinese lackey, confirmed this choice to the satisfaction of all. Renamed Trinli Gyatso and enthroned in 1860, the boy underwent 13 years of intensive tutelage and training before stepping up to rule Tibet at the age of 17. His minority seems a time of even deeper Larsen political intrigue and power struggles than his predecessors. By 1862, this led to a coup by Wang Chuk Shetra, a minister whom the regent had banished for conspiring against him. Shetra contrived to return and deposed the regent, who fled to China and seized power, appointing himself Desi, or Prime Minister. He then ruled with absolute power for three years, quelling a major rebellion in northern Cam in 1863 and re-establishing Tibetan control over significant Qing-held territory there. Shetra died in 1864 and the Kashag reassumed power. The retired 76th Ganden Tripper, Kayen Rab Wangchuk, was appointed as regent, but his role was limited to supervising and mentoring Trinli Gyatso. In 1868, Shetra's coup organizer, a semi literate Ganden monk named Paldon Dondrup, seized power by another coup and ruled as a cruel despot for three years, putting opponents to death by having them sewn into fresh animal skins and thrown in the river. In 1871, at the request of officials outraged after Dondrup had done just that with one minister and imprisoned several others, he in turn was ousted and committed suicide after a counter-coup coordinated by the supposedly powerful regent Kayen Rabwangchuk. As a result of this action, this venerable old regent, who died the next year, is fondly remembered by Tibetans as saviour of the Dalai Lama and the nation. The Kashag and the Songdu, or National Assembly, were reinstated and presided over by a Dalai Lama or his regent, who ruled without further interruption until 1959. According to Smith, however, during Trinli Gyatso's minority, the regent was deposed in 1862 for abuse of authority and closeness with China by an alliance of monks and officials called Gandri Drungche, which translates to the Ganden and Drapung Monks Assembly. This body then ruled Tibet for 10 years until dissolved, when a national assembly of monks and officials called the Songdu was created and took over. 
Smith makes no mention of Shetra or Dondrup acting as usurpers and despots in this period. In any case, Trinley Gyatso died within three years of assuming power. In 1873, at the age of 20, he suddenly became ill and passed away. On the cause of his early death, accounts diverge. Mullin relates an interesting theory based on cited Tibetan sources. Out of concern for the monastic tradition, Trinli Gyatso chose to die and reincarnate as the 13th Dalai Lama, rather than taking the option of marrying a woman called Rigma Somo from Kokonor and leaving an heir to oversee Tibet's future. Shakagpa, on the other hand, without citing sources, notes that Trinli Gyatso was influenced and manipulated by two close acquaintances who were subsequently accused of having a hand in his fatal illness and imprisoned, tortured and exiled as a result. The 13th Dalai Lama assumed ruling power from the monasteries in 1895, which previously had great influence on the regent. During his two periods of exile in 1904 to 1909 to escape the British invasion of 1904 and from 1910 to 1912 to escape a Chinese invasion, he became well aware of the complexities of international politics and was the first Dalai Lama to become aware of the importance of foreign relations. After his return from exile in India and Sikkim during January 1913, he assumed control of foreign relations and dealt directly with the Maharaja and with the British political officer in Sikkim and with the King of Nepal, rather than letting the Kashag or Parliament do it. The 13th Dalai Lama issued a declaration of independence for his kingdom in Usang from China during the summer of 1912 and standardized a Tibetan flag, though no other sovereign state recognized Tibetan independence. He expelled the Ambans and all Chinese civilians in the country and instituted many measures to modernize Tibet. These included provisions to curb excessive demands on peasants for provisions by the monasteries and tax evasion by the nobles, setting up an independent police force, the abolition of the death penalty, extension of secular education and the provision of electricity throughout the city of Lhasa in the 1920s. He died in 1933. The 14th Dalai Lama was born on July 6, 1935 on a straw mat in a cowshed to a farmer's family in a remote part of Tibet. According to most Western journalistic sources, he was born into a humble family of farmers as one of 16 children. The 14th Dalai Lama had become the joint most popular world leader by 2013, tied with Barack Obama, according to a poll conducted by Harris Interactive of New York, which sampled public opinion in the US and six major European countries. The 14th Dalai Lama was not formally enthroned until November 17, 1950, during the Battle of Chamdo with the People's Republic of China. In 1951, the Dalai Lama and the Tibetan government were pressured into accepting the 17-point agreement for the peaceful liberation of Tibet, by which it became formally incorporated into the People's Republic of China. Fearing for his life in the wake of a revolt in Tibet in 1959, the 14th Dalai Lama fled to India from where he led a government in exile. With the aim of launching guerrilla operations against the Chinese, the Central Intelligence Agency funded the Dalai Lama's administration with 1.7 million US dollars a year in the 1960s. In 
In 2001, the 14th Dalai Lama ceded his partial power over the government to an elected parliament of selected Tibetan exiles. His original goal was full independence for Tibet, but by the late 1980s he was seeking high-level autonomy instead. He continued to seek greater autonomy from China, but Dolma Gyari, Deputy Speaker of the Parliament in Exile, stated, If the middle path fails in the short term, we will be forced to opt for complete independence or self-determination as per the UN Charter. In 2014 and 2016, he stated that Tibet wants to be part of China, but China should let Tibet preserve its culture and script. In 2018, he stated that Europe belongs to the Europeans, and that Europe has a moral obligation to aid refugees whose lives are in peril. Further, he stated that Europe should receive help and educate refugees, but ultimately they should return to develop their home countries. In March 2019, the Dalai Lama spoke out about his successor, saying that after his death he is likely to be reincarnated in India. He also warned that any Chinese interference in succession should not be considered valid. In the mid-1970s, Tenzin Gyatso told a Polish newspaper that he thought he would be the last Dalai Lama. In a later interview published in the English language press, he stated the Dalai Lama office was an institution created to benefit others it is possible that it will soon have outlived its usefulness. These statements caused a furore amongst Tibetans in India. Many could not believe that such an option could even be considered. It was further felt that it was not the Dalai Lama's decision to reincarnate. Rather, they felt that since the Dalai Lama is a national institution, it was up to the people of Tibet to decide whether the Dalai Lama should reincarnate. The government of the People's Republic of China has claimed the power to approve the naming of Hai reincarnations in Tibet based on a precedent set by the Qianlong Emperor of the Qing Dynasty. The Qianlong Emperor instituted a system of selecting the Dalai Lama and the Panchen Lama by a lottery that used a golden urn with names wrapped in clumps of barley. This method was used a few times for both positions during the 19th century, but eventually fell into disuse. In 1995, the Dalai Lama chose to proceed with the selection of the 11th reincarnation of the Panchen Lama without the use of the Golden Urn, whilst the Chinese government insisted that it must be used. This has led to two rival Panchen Lamas, Gyan Kane Norbu as chosen by the Chinese government's process, and Jedhan Choeki Naima as chosen by the Dalai Lama. In September 2007, the Chinese government said all high monks must be approved by the government, which would include the selection of the 15th Dalai Lama after the death of Tenzin Gyatso. Since by tradition the Panchen Lama must approve the reincarnation of the Dalai Lama, that is another possible method of control. Consequently, the Dalai Lama has alluded to the possibility of a referendum to determine the 15th Dalai Lama. In response to this scenario, Tashi Wangdi, the representative of the 14th Dalai Lama, replied that the Chinese government's selection would be meaningless. 
You can't impose an imam, an archbishop, saints, any religion. You can't politically impose these things on people, said Wang Di. It has to be a decision of the followers of that tradition. The Chinese can use their political powers, force, again it's meaningless, like their Panchen Lama, and they can't keep their Panchen Lama in Tibet. They tried to bring him to his monastery many times, but people would not see him. How can you have a religious leader like that? The 14th Dalai Lama said as early as 1969 that it was for the Tibetans to decide whether the institution of the Dalai Lama should continue or not. He has given reference to a possible vote occurring in the future for all Tibetan Buddhists to decide whether they wish to recognize his rebirth. In response to the possibility that the PRC might attempt to choose his successor, the Dalai Lama said he would not be reborn in a country controlled by the People's Republic of China or any other country which is not free. According to Robert D. Kaplan, this could mean that the next Dalai Lama might come from the Tibetan cultural belt that stretches across northern India, Nepal and Bhutan, presumably making him even more pro-Indian and anti-Chinese. The 14th Dalai Lama supported the possibility that his next incarnation could be a woman. As an engaged Buddhist, the Dalai Lama has an appeal straddling cultures and political systems, making him one of the most recognized and respected moral voices today. Despite the complex historical, religious and political factors surrounding the selection of incarnate masters in the exiled Tibetan tradition, the Dalai Lama is open to change, author Michaela Haas writes. Why not? What's the big deal? What's the big deal indeed? Only time will tell what history holds for future Dalai Lamas. The only thing we can predict for sure is that no matter what the next incarnation is, he or she will rule with the type of love and intelligence that is expected from someone who is held in such high regards.